Welcome to Love and Money Secrets TV. I'm your host, Dame Lillian Walker, and today we are diving deep into chapter two of Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself by Dr. Joe Dispenza. We're reading, we're reviewing, we're discussing, and we are applying the principles that or principles that Dr. Joe teaches. So let's get started. Chapter two, overcoming, overcoming your environment. It's kind of ironic, isn't it? My environment meant made a little clinky sound. Okay, so overcoming your environment. So by now, I trust that you're beginning to accept the idea that the subjective mind has an effect on the objective world. So you might even be keen to acknowledge that an observer can affect the subatomic world and influence a specific event just by collapsing a single electron from a wave energy, a wave energy that we discussed before, and converting it into a particle through sheer observation. At this point, you may also believe the scientific experiments in quantum mechanics that I have discussed, which prove consciousness directly controls the tiny world of atoms because those elements fundamentally are made of consciousness and energy. That's quantum physics in action, right? But perhaps you're still on the fence about the concept that your mind has real measurable effects in your life. You may be asking yourself, how can my mind influence bigger events in order to change my life? How can I collapse electrons into a specific event called a new experience that I want to embrace in some future time? I wouldn't be surprised if you're wondering about your ability to create full-size experiences in the larger world of reality. So my goal is that you understand and can see in action how there might be a scientific basis for accepting that your thoughts can create your reality. For the doubter though, I would like to entertain, I would like you to entertain the possibility that the way you think directly affects your life. So keep revisiting familiar thoughts and feelings and you keep creating the same reality. So if you can accept this paradigm as a possibility, then by pure reason, you would also have to agree that the following is also possible. To create something different from what you've grown accustomed to in your personal world, you have to change the way you routinely think and feel each day. So otherwise, by repeatedly thinking and feeling the same way you did the day before and the day before that, you will continue to create the same circumstances in your life, which will cause you to experience the same emotions, which will influence you to think equal to those emotions. So going out on a limb here, permit me to compare the situation to the proverbial hamster in a wheel. As you continually think about your problems, consciously or unconsciously, you will only create more of the same type of difficulties you, you know, for yourself. And maybe you think about your problems so much because it was your thinking that in fact created them in the first place. So perhaps your troubles feel so real because you constantly revisit those familiar feelings that initially created the problem. So if you insisted on thinking and feeling equal to the circumstances in your life, you will reaffirm that particular reality. So in the next few chapters, I want to focus on what you need to understand in order to change. To change, be greater than your environment, your body, and time. So most people focus on three things in their life, their environment, their bodies, and time. They don't just focus on those three elements. They think equal to them. But to break the habit of being yourself, you have to think greater than the circumstances of your life. Be greater than the feelings that you have memorized 
in your body and live in a new line of time. So if you want to change, you must have in your thoughts an idealized self version of you, a model that you can emulate, which is different from and better than the you that exists today in your particular environment, body, and time. I'm going to pause right here. I just, I just had a Facebook live broadcast that we did today with Ben Gay the third. He is an amazing human being. He is the best-selling author of many, many books, including the book series, The Closers. He worked with and worked for Earl Nightingale and Napoleon Hill. And um, Bob Proctor was his, was a co-worker with him. They all worked at, for you know, William Penn Patrick. I think he said it was 45 years ago, 50 years ago. 55 years ago, I think is what he said. And he also brought up, there was a young man whose name is Lamont, who I guess 15, 20 years ago, he was in a federal state prison and he was a drug dealer and didn't have a high school education. And, you know, society at large, somebody like that, you pretty much write them off and you figure, okay, they'll be in federal prison, you know, serving uh, whatever sentence they'll get out and they'll just get back in again and they'll be in and out of that federal prison system for the rest of their lives, you know, you know, the poor black child type type situation. And somebody ended up referring him to him and in less than a week's time, actually, he was actually still in the prison, I guess, when this, when he was, when he met him. But the whole point of what I want to share with you was that this young man at the time was in prison somebody referred Ben because Ben was actually working with the prison system in addition to the corporate clients that he had and somebody referred him and this young man in less than a week's time after having met Ben changed his languaging changed his plans and changed his thoughts uh, this guy's goal or plan was that as soon as he got out of prison he was going to steal $500 some way somehow so that he would have the seed money to buy more drugs so that he could continue to sell drugs. And so the person who referred him to Ben told Ben that. And then when Ben spoke to him, I guess in an open forum, he kind of outed that and then showed him how he could actually turn his life around if he just thought, planned, and did different things. And that's exactly what Dr. Joe is talking about right here. And if that young man, fast forward now, that young man ended up becoming an attorney and is now in the process of becoming a judge. And who would have ever thought that he could have made such a transformation? And so he went from selling illegal drugs to then selling legal pharmaceutical drugs to then eventually making a leap where he ended up going to law school, you know, went to, got his GED, went to college, then went to law school, became an attorney, and now is up for being potentially a judge, probably any day now. So if you want to watch that interview, that'll be probably in the next 48 to 72 hours, I'll put that up. If you go to my Facebook Live page, you'll be able to take a look at that interview. That was a Facebook Live that started at 3 p.m. today, Pacific Central Time. But it was absolutely incredible how that one life was turned around because he had a mentor that was willing to invest energy and uh, give him guidance. And the thing is, you can do this for yourself. Yes, you can find a partner that you can, you know, I, I always suggest if you have a best friend that's on the same page of music with you, where you're both on the self-improvement path, you both are wanting to succeed, you both want to improve the outcomes, and always, you know, like the Japanese principle, the Kaizen principle, always making things better then you can be accountability partners and, and do this. If you want to change, you must have in your thoughts an idealized self, a model that you can emulate, which is different from and better than the you that exists today in your particular environment, body, and time. Every great person in history knew how to do this. And you can attain greatness in your own life once you master the concepts and techniques to come. 
So in this chapter, we'll focus on how you can overcome your environment and lay some groundwork for the two chapters that follow, in which we'll discuss how to overcome your body and your time. So our memories make up our internal environment. Before we begin talking about how you can break the habit of becoming yourself or being yourself, I want to appeal to your common sense just for a few moments. So how did this habit of thinking and feeling in the same way over and over and over again begin? I can only answer that by talking about the brain and the starting point of our thoughts and feelings. Current neuroscientific theory tells us that the brain is organized to reflect everything we know in our environment. All the information we have been exposed to throughout our entire lives in the form of knowledge and experiences is stored in the brain's synaptic connections. Quick little pause here. Don't know if you guys know this. Many of you probably do. So, but for those of you who don't, the neurons that are in your brain actually look like fingers of a hand. They actually, they actually look very much like a hand. You can think of these uh, as the dendrites. These are the filaments. They call them filaments. You have the axonal head, the axon, which is the head of the nerve. You have the dendrites, which is what makes it possible for the nerves to connect and touch each other quite literally like this, and then you have the stem of the nerve. And so they connect, they fire and wire electricity, and they touch each other. And as they touch each other, that is what passes the electricity from one nerve onto another nerve, okay? So current neuroscientific theory tells us that the brain is organized to reflect everything we know in our environment and all the information we have been exposed to throughout our entire lives in the form of knowledge, and experiences, and it's stored in the brain's synaptic connections. So the relationships we, with people we've known, the variety of things we own and are familiar with, the places where we visited and lived at different times in our lives, and the myriad of experiences we've embraced throughout our years are all configured in the structures of the brain. And even the vast array of actions and behaviors that we've memorized and repeatedly performed throughout our lifetimes are imprinted in the delicate, intricate folds of our gray matter. Hence, all of our personal experiences with people and things at specific times and places are literally reflected within the networks of neurons, nerve cells that make up our brains. So what do we collectively call all of these memories? of people and things that we experienced at different places and times in our lives. That's our external environment. So for, most, for the most part, our brains are equal to our environment, a record of our personal past, a reflection of the light that we have lived. So during our waking hours, as we routinely interact with the diverse stimuli in our world, our external environment activates various brain circuits. And as a consequence of that nearly automatic response, we begin to think and react equal to our environment. So as the environment causes us to think, familiar networks of nerve cells fire that reflective previous experiences already wired in the brain. I'm gonna pause right here. One of the phenomena that is unique to the brain and to human beings is that we like to embrace and capture that which is familiar. So we have a propensity, a, procl a proclivity to want to repeat that which is familiar. Even if that which is familiar is uncomfortable or painful, if that's what you're used to and it's a known pain, you're more apt to want to repeat that and your brain will fire and wire for you to repeat that experience over and over again, rather than risk the fear of the unknown, even though the unknown may be pleasant and it may be painless, but because you're not familiar with it, it takes very conscious, mindful effort for you to embrace that which is unfamiliar, which is really at the foundation and the crux of Dr. Joe's work. He shows you systematically with a formulaic approach how to actually apply a formula that, it, that, that works every single time. You do it and it's just a matter of time before you start to see results.
okay? So essentially, we automatically think in familiar ways derived from past memories. So if your thoughts determine your reality and you keep thinking the same thoughts, which are a product of the reflection of the environment, then you will continue to produce the same reality day after day. Thus, your internal thoughts and feelings exactly match your external life because it is your outer reality with all of its problems, conditions, and circumstances that is influencing how you're thinking and feeling in your inner reality. Familiar memories remind us to reproduce the same experience. I'm gonna hit the pause button again. As many of you know, if you're familiar with me, you know that I absolutely love words. I um, acknowledge, I embrace the power of not only the spoken word, the written word, and the word in thoughts, deeds, as well as actions. And here it says, if you're looking on your book, we're on chapter two, we're on page 42, by the way. And it says here, familiar memories remind us to reproduce the same experiences, but remind us, it's written R-E, there's a hyphen, M-I-N. So I want you to pay attention to what the word remind us really means. Remind. It's to mind again. It's a do-over mind. So that's what the word to remind us, to remember. To remember means to, in the member of your body, you are embodying it again. Why? Because thoughts are the language of the brain and feelings and emotions are the language of the body. So in order for you to remember or to remind yourself, you have to pay attention to the member redoing itself in order to recall a past thought, feeling, or emotion, or a past thought, feeling, or experience. The two are, and they're connected. That's part of the secret of breaking the habit of being yourself. Once you recognize that, oh, I can disconnect the two and I can separate the emotions that are lodged in my body, because your body's a filing cabinet of every thought, feeling, and emotion you've ever had. And it has an emotional response down to the cellular level. So it's not just the flesh as in your muscles and your blood and the organs in your body, but down to the cellular memory. And so from an atom all the way to the skin is the largest, largest organ of the body, as you know, being that as it may, your cells individually have its own state of consciousness and each organ of the body has its own state of consciousness. And then the entire body as a collective has its consciousness, which you yourself have the free will to choose how to focus it on whatever it is that you, whether it's want or don't want, it doesn't matter. Whatever you focus on is going to expand. Okay. So remind us to reproduce the same experiences. So every day, as you see the same people, your boss, for example, and your spouse and kid do the same things, drive to work, perform your daily tasks, do the workout, the same workout, go to some, the same places, your favorite coffee shop, the grocery store you frequent and your place of employment, look at the same objects, your car, your house, your toothbrush, even your own body, your familiar memories related to your known world, you remind yourself to reproduce the same sequences. So we could say that the environment is actually controlling your mind. It's neuroscientific definition of mind is the brain in action. You repeatedly reproduce the same level of mind by reminding yourself who you think you are in reference to the outer world. Your identity becomes defined by everything outside of you because you identify with all of the elements that make up your external world. So thus, 
you're observing your reality with a mind that is equal to it. So you collapse the infinite waves of possibility and probabilities of the quantum field into events that reflect the mind you used to experience life. So you create more of the same. There are clues here. You may not think that your environment and your thoughts are that rigidly similar and your reality so easily reproduced. But when you consider that your brain is a complete record of the past, pause button here. If you have a highlighter pen and you're following along in your own paperback or your Kindle or your iPad, I'm gonna have you highlight this. When you consider that your brain is a complete record of your past, make no mistakes friends and gems, your brain is a complete record of the past, not even of the present or of the future. It's of the past. It records everything, whether you're conscious or unconscious, every thought, feeling, emotion, experience, everything is logged in there, period. It includes everything. It leaves nothing out. When you consider that your brain is a complete record of your past and your mind, which is not the same thing as your brain, your mind is the product of your consciousness. In one sense, you might always be thinking in the past by responding with the same brain hardware that matches what you remember. You're creating a level of mind that is identical to the past because your brain is automatically firing existing circuits to reflect everything you already know, have experienced, and thus can predict. So I'm going to pause right here because one of the things, like I mentioned before, the brain and human beings, we are hardwired to stick with the familiar, even if the familiar is uncomfortable, painful, not what we want, but you can you keep on, it's like a scratch record until you become conscious and you're awake and you realize the different, you have a differentiation. You actually embrace the distinction between your conscious awareness as opposed to your brain, the organ, which is the the organ or organism that can interpret the vibrational frequencies of sight, smell, gustatory, auditory, sensory, et cetera, proprioceptor, interoceptor, nanoceptor, mechanoceptor systems in the body, which are how our entire neurological system is made up so that we can fire and wire appropriately and navigate our way throughout the world, okay? So keep that in mind because there is a distinction between your awareness, which you can choose to focus on what it is that you want, or you can choose to focus on what you don't want, and then you'll just get more of that. Your brain and then your ego. So you can now use your ego and your brain in the awareness that you are the master of it. And you are in fact the conscious awareness that has the free will to cho choose to focus on whatever it is that you want. According to quantum law, which by the way is still working for you, whether you know it or not, you can be in ignorance of it or not. If you are in awareness of it, you are far more powerful than if you are in ignorance of it. Most people are in ignorance of it, so you're going off of a lot of default programming unbeknownst to you. But this is here for you to empower yourself so that you can embrace it. And now you have both of your hands on the steering wheel of your awareness. And you can start to create in all areas of your life, whatever it is that you're putting your target, your focus, wherever you put your focus and attention to, there's the bullseye, there's the target. You're gonna hit it every single time. It's just a matter of time and space and it's going to pop into your existence. So reason this, when you think from your past memories, you can only create past experiences. So as all of the knowns, the familiar, in your life causes 
cause your brain to think and feel in familiar ways, thus creating knowable outcomes, you continuously and continually reaffirm your life as you know it. And since your brain is equal to your environment, then each morning, your senses plug you into the same reality and initiate the same stream of consciousness. So all of the sensory input that your brain processes from the external world that is seeing, smelling, hearing, feeling, and tasting turns your brain on to think equal to everything familiar in your reality. So you open your eyes and you know the person lying next to you is your spouse because of your past experiences together. However, you hear barking outside your door and you know it's your dog wanting to go out. There's a pain in your back and you remember it's the same pain you felt yesterday. You associate your outer familiar world with who you think you are by remembering yourself in this dimension, this particular time and space. Our routines, plugging into our past self. What do most of us do each morning after we've been plugged into our reality by these sensory reminders of who we are, where we are, and so forth? Well, we remain plugged into this past self by following a highly routine, unconscious set of automatic behaviors. So for example, you probably wake up on the same side of the bed, slip into your robe the same way as you look into the mirror to remember who you are and shower following an automatic routine. Then you groom yourself to look like everyone expects you to look and brush your teeth in your usual memorized fashion. You drink coffee out of your favorite mug and eat your customary breakfast cereal. You put on the jacket you always wear and unconsciously zip it up and next you automatically drive to work along your accustomed convenient route and at work you do familiar things that you have memorized how to do so well you see the same people who push your same emotional buttons which causes you to think the same thoughts about those people and your work and your life so later you hurry up and go home so you can hurry up and eat so that you can hurry up and watch your same TV show so you can hurry up and go to bed so you can hurry up and do it all over again. Has your brain changed at all that day? I'm going to pause right here. Now you see why it is that we call this being asleep because there's real no, there's no conscious thought. You're basically an automaton. You're, you're like a robot that has been programmed to, like it says here, you hurry up and go home you, so that you can hurry up and eat, so that you can hurry up and watch your favorite TV show or sports, so you can hurry up and go to bed, so you can hurry up and do it all over again day after day, 365 days a year for 40 hours a week for 40 years, and then you drop dead and it's all over. It sounds very depressing to me. Does that sound depressing to you? I don't know about you, but that's not what I signed up for. So guess what? That's not what, that's not what I do. And trust me, I used to be the worry and hurry gal, but I'm not the worry and hurry gal any longer. So why are you secretly expecting something different to show up in your life when you think the same thoughts that, and perform the same actions and experience the same emotions every single day. Isn't that the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting a different outcome? Yes, my friends and gems, that is insane. That's crazy to expect a different outcome if you put this input, the same exact input over and over again, of course you're gonna have the same output. Those are natural and logical consequences. It's Newton's third law of physics, you know, for equal, for every, any uh, equal and opposite, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, and it's the cause and effect, Newtonian model. So all of us have fallen prey to this type of limited life, one time or another. By now, you probably understand the reason why. 
In the preceding example, it is safe to say that you're reproducing the same level of mind every day. Sounds kind of flat and boring, doesn't it? And if the quantum world shows that the environment is an extension of your mind and that mind and matter are actually one, then as long as your mind remains the same, your life will stay status quo. So thus, if your environment remains the, the same and you react by thinking in the same way, then according to the quantum model of reality, shouldn't you create more of the same? Think of it this way. The input remains the same, so the output has to remain the same. So how then can you ever create anything new? You know the answer to that. Hardwired to hard times. There is another possible consequence that I should mention. If you keep firing the same neural patterns by living your life the same way each day, every time you respond to your familiar reality by recreating the same mind, that is turning on the same nerve cells to make the brain work in the same way, you hardwire your brain to match the customary conditions in your personal reality. And be it good or bad, doesn't make any difference to the brain. The brain doesn't discriminate Whatever the input is, is whatever the input is. It's absolute. There is a principle in neuroscience called Hebb's Law. It's basically stating that nerve cells that fire together, wire together. So Hebb's Credo demonstrates that if you repeatedly activate the nerve cells, then each time they turn on, it will be easier for them to fire in unison again. Eventually, those neurons will develop a long-term relationship. And I hit the pause button right here. It's no different really than your computer. When you first start going to certain websites, you start using certain programs in your computer. Your, your computer, since it doesn't know what your behavioral habits are yet, it takes a little bit longer, more system resources, CPU usage, in order for it to pull from wherever it is that it's stored because it has to do algorithms. It actually has to do many, many mathematical computations and mathematical formulations in order to pull that data from wherever it is in your computer, be it your hard drive, your external hard drive, your scan disk, whatever it is that you have um, plugged into your computer. Now, as you repeatedly go back repeating the same actions, it takes less and less CPU energy, less CPU system resources, because it knows exactly the path and it doesn't take very long for those mathematical computations. In fact, your computer kind of keeps like a phantom algorithmic calculation just at the surface because it knows that this is, this is a normal electronic pathway to get to the destination to bring you the result that you want. Your brain is very much like that too. It has to do with Hebb's law, and they just discussed here, so that the cells that fire and wire together, they sync and link together. And that's how a long-term relationship is created inside your brain, whether it's a brand new, if it's something that's brand new, the right side of your brain now will start to fire and wire in recognition of something new. And as we discussed before, Candell did a study where he actually was able to prove that when it's habituation, something that's a habit that you constantly do that you don't have to think about anymore, that is stored on the left-hand side of the brain and it only takes 1,300 neural synapses for you to do that activity, just 1,300. But just by your being exposed to this information that you haven't read before, you're reading this, you're hearing, seeing, experiencing new information, guess what? Instead of 1300, now you're actually, you've made your IQ go up because your brain is now using 2600 neurological um, synapses start firing and wiring together. There's a heck of a lot more electricity, double the electricity running through your brain just to familiarize, absorb, retain, and learn this new information. So make no mistakes. Congratulations, you're making yourself smarter just by being exposed to this information and seeking it out. I don't know about you, 
but I find that incredibly exciting. Okay, moving on. So when I use the word hardwired, it means that clusters of neurons have fired so many times in the same ways that they have organized themselves into specific patterns with long lasting connections. So the more of these networks of neurons that fire, the more they wire into static routes of activity. So in time, whatever the oft repeated thought, behavior, or feeling is, it will become an automatic unconscious habit. When your environment is influencing your mind to that extent, your habitat becomes your habit. So if you keep thinking the same thoughts, doing the same things, and feeling the same emotions, you will begin to hardwire your brain into a finite pattern that is the direct reflection of your finite reality. Consequently, it will become easier and more natural for you to reproduce the same mind on a moment to moment basis. This innocent response cycle causes your brain and then your mind to reinforce even further the particular reality that is your external world. The more you fire the same circuits by reacting to your external life, the more you're going to wire your brain to be equal to your personal world. So you'll become neurochemically attached to the conditions in your life. In time, you'll begin to think in the box because your brain will fire a finite set of circuits that then creates a very specific mental signature. This signature is called your personality. So how you form the habit of being yourself as an effect of this neural habituation, the two realities of the inner mind and the outer world seem to become almost inseparable. For instance, if you can never stop thinking about your problems, then your mind and your life will merge together as one. The objective world is now colored by the perceptions of your subjective mind and thus reality continuously conforms. So you become lost in the illusion of the dream. You could call this a rut and we all fall into them, but it goes much deeper than that. And not just your actions, but also your attitudes and your feelings become repetitive. So you have formed the habit of be, of becoming yourself and in a sense, enslaved yourself to your environment. So your thinking has become equal to the conditions in your life. And thus you as the quantum observer are creating a mind that only reaffirms those circumstances into your specific reality. All you are doing is reacting to your external known unchanging world. In a very, very real way, you have become an effect of circumstances outside of yourself. So you have allowed yourself to give up control of your destiny. And unlike Bill Murray's character in the movie Groundhog Day, you're not even fighting against the ceaseless monotony of what you are like and what your life has become. Worse, you aren't the victim of some mysterious and unseen force that has placed you in this repetitive loop. You are the creator of that loop. The good news is that since you created this loop, you can choose to end it and recreate a new loop. So the quantum model of reality tells us that to change our lives, we must fundamentally change the ways we think, act, and feel. We must change the state of being because how we think, feel, and behave is in essence our personality. It is our personality that creates our own personal reality. So to create a new personal reality, a new life, we must create a new personality. We must become someone else. So to change then is to think greater. You have to think and act greater 
than our present circumstances, greater than our environment. Greatness is holding fast to a dream independent of the environment. So before I begin to explore the ways in which you can think greater than your environment and thus break the habit of being yourself, I want to remind you of something. It is possible to think greater than your present reality and history books are filled with names of people who have done so. Men such as Martin Luther King Jr., William Wallace, Marie Curie, Mahatma Gandhi, Thomas Edison, and Joan of Arc. Every one of these individuals had a concept in his or her mind of a future reality that existed as a potential in the quantum field. This vision was alive in an inner world of possibilities beyond the senses and in time. Each of these people made those ideas a reality. So as a common thread, they all had a dream, vision, or objective that was much larger than they were. They all believed in a future destiny that was so real in their minds that they began to live as if that dream were already happening. They couldn't see it. They couldn't hear it. They couldn't taste it, smell it, or feel it. But they were so possessed by their dream that they acted in a way that corresponded to this potential reality ahead of time. In other words, they behaved as if what they envisioned was already a reality. So for example, the imperialist dictum that had India under colonial rule in the 1900s was demoralizing to Indians, despite that Gandhi believed in a reality that wasn't yet present in his people's lives. So he wholeheartedly endorsed the concepts of equality, of freedom, and nonviolence with undying conviction. Even though Gandhi endorsed liberty for all, the reality of tyranny and British control at that time was really quite different. And the conventional beliefs of that era were in contrast to his hopes and his aspirations. So although the experience of liberty was not a reality, and while he was initially engaged in changing India, he did not let outward evidence of adversity sway him to give up his ideal. So for a long time, much of the feedback from the external world didn't show Gandhi that he was making a difference, but seldom did he allow the conditions in his environment to control his way of thinking and being. So he believed in a future that he could not yet see or experience with his five senses, but which was so alive in his mind that he could not live any other way. So he embraced a new future life while physically living his present life, he understood that the way he was thinking, acting, and feeling would change the current conditions in his environment. And he eventually, reality began to change as a result of his efforts. So when our behaviors match our intentions, when our actions are equal to our thoughts, when our minds and bodies are working together, when our words and our deeds are actually aligned, there is an immense power behind any individual. History giants, why their dreams were unrealistic nonsense. So the greatest individuals in history were unwaveringly committed to a future destiny without any need for immediate feedback from the environment. It didn't matter to them if they hadn't received any sensory indication or physical evidence of the change they wanted. They must have reminded themselves daily of the reality they were focused upon. Their minds were ahead of their present environment because their environment no longer controlled their thinking. Pause. Highlight that, you know, friends and gems because their environment no longer controlled their thinking. 
there's another key to success right there. You need to have your environment no longer controlling your thinking. Don't worry about what our government's doing. Don't worry about COVID. Don't worry about whatever, whatever your triggers are for stress and worry and hurry and nerves and anxiety and freaking out and losing control or feeling depressed or feeling sad or being melancholic or creating a party of one, the ultimate pity party, victimhood. No, you can say, you know what? I choose to, I'm throwing all of that and deleting all of that from the hardware of my, of this computer that I call Lillian, whatever it is that your parents named you whatever you call yourself, okay? So another fundamental element shared by each of these celebrated beings was that they were clear in their minds about exactly what they wanted to happen. Remember, we leave the how to the greater mind and they must have known this. Now, some in their day might have called them unrealistic. In fact, they were completely unrealistic and so were their dreams. The event they were embracing in thought, action, and emotion was not realistic because the reality, reality had not occurred yet. The ignorant and the cynical might have also said their vision was nonsense, and such naysayers would have been right. A vision of future reality was nonsense. It existed in a reality beyond the senses. As another example, Joan of Arc was considered foolhardy even insane. Her ideas challenged the beliefs of her time and made her a threat to the present political system. But once her vision was made manifest, she was considered profoundly virtuous. So when one holds a dream independent of the environment, that's greatness. Another pause button. Your environment includes anybody in your environment, not just the trees, the houses, your neighborhood, your city, your state, your country, your county. It also includes anybody that you pay attention to, anybody who you give your power away to, anybody who tries to control you, anybody who wants you to, you know, or requires you to be accountable to them in any way, shape, or form. They're trying to exercise some, some sort of control over you. That's part of your environment. That's all outside of you. Make no mistakes. It's difficult to change yourself and it's almost impossible to change somebody else. So give up the battle of trying to make somebody else change, somebody to be you know, more quiet or more outgoing or whatever whatever your obsession is, whatever, pick your poison. Abandon that and harness all the energy inside of your being and choose it to change yourself, to be the greatest version of yourself. And you can abort, you can divorce, you can delete, you can put in the back burner in a non-operating system in the computer of your body, your old personality, and now you're gonna embrace the most loving, the fullest expression of yourself, the most magnificent co-creator where you are able to manifest, create, explore, and enjoy some of the more wonderful aspects that this life has to offer. Wouldn't you agree that you have suffered enough, you've toiled enough, you've worked hard enough, and now you just want to bear some of the fruit of your labor? Because make no mistakes, every experience that you've had that has brought you to this moment is a stepping stone. It's part of what made you you. It brought you to this very moment in time where you and I are looking at each other through this lamar, this lamar kens, <laughs> this camera lens. Make no mistakes. No experience is wasted ever. It's all for your benefit, all of it. And now, you're going to able to leapfrog, quantum leap, quite literally. You're gonna be able to quantum leap and you're gonna be able to accomplish more in less time, things that you didn't even think were humanly possible. And you're gonna be in amazement. 
and you're going to continue to grow and expand. So coming up, we're, we'll see that overcoming the environment is inextricably linked with overcoming the body and time. And in Gandhi's case, he was not swayed by what was happening in his outer world or his environment. He didn't even worry about how he felt and what would happen to him, his body. And he didn't care how long it would take to realize the dream of freedom, time. So he simply knew that all of these elements would sooner or later bend to his intentions. So for all of the giants in history, it is possible that their ideas were thriving in the laboratory of their minds to such an extent that to their brains, it was as though the experience had already happened. Can you too change who you are by thought alone? Mental rehearsal, how our thoughts can become our experience. So neuroscience has proven that we can change our brains and therefore our behaviors, attitudes and beliefs just by thinking and thinking differently. So in other words, without changing anything in our environment through mental rehearsal, repeatedly imagining performing an action, the circuits in the brain can reorganize themselves to reflect our objectives. So we can make our thoughts so real that the brain changes to look like the event has already happened and become a physical reality. So we can change it to be ahead of any actual experience in the external world. Now, here's an example. In Evolve Your Brain, I discussed how research subjects who mentally rehearsed one handed piano exercises for two hours a day for five days, never actually touching any piano keys, demonstrated almost the same brain changes as people who physically performed the identical finger movements on a piano keyboard for the same length of time. So functional brain scans showed that all of the participants activated and expanded clusters of neurons in the same specific area of the brain. And in essence, the group who mentally rehearsed practicing scales and chords grew nearly the same number of brain circuits as the group who physically engaged in the activity. So this study demonstrates two important points. Not only can we change our brains just by thinking differently, but when we are truly focused and single-minded, the brain does not know the difference between the internal world of the mind and what we experience in the external environment. So our thoughts can become our experience. This notion is critical to your success or failure in your endeavor to replace old habits, prune old neural connections with new ones, sprout new neural networks. So let's look more closely at how the same learning sequence took place in those people who mentally practiced but never physically played any notes. Whether we physically or mentally acquire a skill, there are four elements that we all use to change our brains. Learning knowledge, receiving hands-on instruction, paying attention, and then repetition. Learning is making synaptic connections. Instruction gets the body involved. So in order to have a new experience and which further enriches the brain, when we also pay attention and repeat our new skill over and over and over, our brains change. So the group who physically played the scales and chords grew new brain circuits because they followed this formula. The participants who mentally rehearsed also followed this formula, except that they never got their bodies physically involved and in their minds, they were easily able to conceive of themselves playing the piano. So now remember, after these subjects repeatedly mentally practiced, their brains showed the same neurological changes as the participants who actually played the piano. New networks of neurons, neural networks, were forged, demonstrating that in effect, they had already engaged in practicing piano scales and chords without actually having that physical experience. We could say that their brains 
existed in the future ahead of the physical event of playing the piano because of our enlarged human frontal lobe and our unique ability to make thought more real than anything else, the forebrain can naturally lower the volume from the external environment so that nothing else is being processed but a single-minded thought. So this type of internal processing allows us to become so involved in our mental imaging that the brain will modify its wiring without having experienced the actual event. So when we can change our minds independent of the environment and then steadfastly embrace an ideal when sustained concentration, then the brain will be ahead of the environment. That is mental rehearsal, an important tool in breaking the habit of being yourself. If we repeatedly think about something to the exclusion of everything, everything else, we encounter a moment when the thought becomes experience. When this occurs, the neural hardware is rewired to reflect the thought as the experience. This is the moment that our thinking changes our brains and thus our minds. So to understand that neurological change can take place in the absence of physical interactions in the environment is crucial to our success in breaking the habit of being ourselves. Consider the larger implications of the finger exercise experiment. If we apply that same process, mental rehearsal to anything that we want to do, we can change our brains ahead of any concrete experience. So if you can influence your brain to change before you experience a desired future event, you will create the appropriate neural circuits that will enable you to behave in alignment with your intention before it becomes a reality in your life through your own repeated mental rehearsal of a better way to think, act, or be, you will install the neural hardware needed to physiologically prepare you for a new event. In fact, you'll do more than that. The brain's hardware, as I use the analogy in this book, refers to its physical structures, its anatomy, right down to the neurons. So if you keep installing, reinforcing, and refining your neurological hardware, the end result of that repetition is a neural network, in effect, a new software program. Just like a computer software, this program, for example, a behavior, an attitude or an emotional state now runs automatically. So now you've cultivated the brain to be ready for your new experience. And frankly, you have the mind in place so that you can handle the challenge. So when you change your mind, your brain changes. And when you change your brain, your mind changes. So when the time comes to demonstrate a vision contrary to the environmental conditions at hand, it is quite possible for you to, to be already prepared to think and act with a conviction that is steadfast and unwavering. In fact, the more you formulate an image of your behavior in a future event, the easier it will be for you to execute a new way of being. So can you believe in a future you cannot see or experience with your senses, but have thought about enough times in your mind that your brain is actually changed to look like the experience has already happened ahead of the physical event in your external environment? If so, then your brain is no longer a record of the past but has become a map to your future. So now that you know you can change your brain by thinking differently, it is possible to change your body to look, look like it too has had an experience ahead of the actual intended circumstance. Is your mind that powerful? Stay tuned. Well, my friends and gems, that is the end of chapter two. This is, I'm mesmerized every time I 
dive in deep with this content because I think it's so fascinating, fascinating how we as human beings have so much untapped potential, so much untapped creativity, so much untapped powerful energy that we can mold into whatever it is that we want. And when you have the realization that your conscious awareness, that your brain and that your ego are not really one in the same, and you see the distinction and you become acutely aware of your focused awareness and the recognition that your brain is just an archive, it's a filing cabinet of all the past thoughts, feelings of, and emotions that you're, that you're being as a body, as a physical body has experienced, recording the emotions in the, in the flesh down to the cellular level, and then interpreting vibrational frequencies through auditory, visual, olfactory, gustatory, gustatory, and then tactile through those five sensory systems. And there's actually three or four other, like I mentioned before, your proprioceptor system, your enteroceptor system, etc. So when you recognize that your conscious awareness, your free will, you have free will in your conscious awareness, and you can use that consciousness now to focus it on what it is that you want on purpose. So instead of having a, uh, an undesirable circumstance that's in front of you that you're witnessing right now in 3D, you can hit the pause button and go, okay, I'm not going to freak out. I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to get nervous. I'm not going to panic. You might already feel the feelings of panic, nervousness, anxiety, the jitters, whatever the case might be. And you can go, I'm going to hit the pause button. What am I going to do? Hit the pause button. I'm not going to react. I'm going to choose to slow down my heart rate, slow down my breath and slow down my brain waves. You just, that's your go-to. I'm going to hit the pause button. Nope. Freaking out, worrying, oh my gosh, going or getting mad. That's not going to change anything. It's going to cement in what's there to remain there and create more of that. So we don't want to use those emotions to fuel, add fuel to that fire. Instead, hit the pause button. Say, okay, pause button, no reaction. You're disattached. And now I'm going to take a deep breath. I'm going to slow down my heart rate. I'm going to slow down my breath and I'm going to slow down my brain waves. I'm going to get into theta and now I'm going to take a moment to center myself, be with a conscious awareness. I'm no one, nobody, nothing, nowhere, no place and no time. I'm going to basically detach from the feelings of my body and I'm just going to focus on that awareness. And now I'm going to, yeah, in that stillness, I am now going to put in the intention of what it is that I want. If you just got into a car accident, you're going to put yourself out of a car accident, seeing yourself in a car that is whole prior to the accident, or maybe a better one than, the, than you have right now. If you just lost a job, you see yourself saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, telling your best friend, oh my gosh, look, I landed this new job. You know, who would have thought that 72 hours later, 48 hours after I was let go or was fired or the company closed down, that within 48 hours, I would have, and you're just daydreaming, mind casting, trans surfing, transmuting, alkalizing, visualizing, pretending in your mind's eye in 5D quantum, whatever, languaging resonates most with you embrace it take it and use it and then you allow yourself to have that elevated emotion of joy and of gratitude because the way you seal the whole package is once you're like excited and you're going oh my gosh yes then you're like in gratitude yes 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 thank you thank you thank you and you visualize yourself talking having a conversation with your best friend saying oh my gosh look who would have thought, you know, within X amount of time, 48 hours, 72 hours, I've got this new job. I'm having, I'm getting paid more, less time involved, better everything. Who would have ever thought that this was, was so within my reach? I would have, you know, I would have stayed stuck in that old job thinking that that's all I was able to 
have and the reality life had so much more to offer me and boy that was the best thing that ever happened to me and that could be your reality and that's what this work is all about it could be that you're struggling with some sort of health condition any kind of condition that you're struggling with this is the magic this is how you're going to turn your boat around you're going to put your hands on the steering wheel and you're, you're going to decide am i going to go left i'm going to go right First thing you need to do is you need to know what it is that you want. Uh, and I will reveal to you that one of the things that, uh, this is about 20 years ago now, yeah. Um, we were doing uh, some healing circles in a very large group. And I remember there was a gal who had diabetes who had a sub-Q pump which is, if you don't know what a sub-Q pump, it kind of looks like a little pager. It's about this big. It has a tiny little vial and it has um, concentrated, in her case, insulin because she needed to, just like uh, an IV, you can give yourself a bolus, an extra hit of whatever drug that is in your IV. This is somebody that needs to have a constant amount of insulin that's put into her, into their muscle so that they're they have the proper amount of insulin and every now and then, because, you know, we're all chemistry, you know, they might eat something that will throw their sugars off. So they need to get an extra dosage of, of insulin. So in her particular case, um, it was amazing because there were a lot of people that were coming to this particular uh, event to be healed. And we were, there was a group of like 10 of us and with the subject person to be healed. And I think I've mentioned before that I have this thing, I call it intuitive cognizance, where you have a knowing and then you have a word of knowledge. And, and so um, it, as she went into the center of, the, of our group, it hit me that she didn't want to be healed, which shocked me because some people don't want to be healed. And you're like, well, why would anybody not want to be healed? Because sometimes the personality of the person having a condition serves a purpose in that person's life to get others to do something for them. So you have more people volunteering to make your life easier for you, uh, so on and so forth. And so her identity and her personality was so wrapped up in her diabetic condition that she was holding on to it for dear life. So she came up saying that she wanted to be healed, but her subconscious mind, I believe that it was subconscious, was petrified of losing that identity. It's like, no, we're not gonna, you know, it's like, we can't let this go because if we let that go, who are we gonna be? And how will you, you know, how would she get her husband to come home early from work and to take, you know, all this different time off to help her with the boys and, and all that kind of stuff. All of that, like in a flash second, it was like revealed to me and I was like, oh, wow, it was, for me, it was a lot to take in at the time. And we had other, and of course she didn't heal. And then there are others, you know, there was, you know, somebody who was deaf, who, who all of a sudden now could hear, who hadn't been able to hear since they were five. Uh, we had another person whose leg literally grew, like, I think it was like three or four inches because they were born with some sort of birth defect so that they, they had to have those special orthopedic shoes that are like three inches platforms. And then all of a sudden you could actually see it while we were praying and we were doing our healing and you could actually see the leg actually start to come into place. It was a trip. So all that to say is that you have to really recognize and embrace who it is that you are and who is it that you want to be and recognize that some of those things that maybe you have lost to your, you're going to lose, you know, there's some advantages to being the victim of always having to, you know, be falling short that you've used in life to survive. You're going to have to get rid of that. And as an empowered individual where you're self-sufficient, where you're not just surviving, but now you're thriving, flourishing in prosperity and in abundance. So you aren't going to need, you're not going to need pity help anymore. The energy of pity and, oh, look at, she's a poor victim. 
you're not going to need that anymore. And instead, you're going to have people who are going to want to come side by side. They're still going to help you, but it's a different, it's a cleaner energy. So think about that. If, if that resonates with you, could, it could be that that might be part of your history and part of the mystery of who you are. And maybe it's a role that you might be sick and tired of being sick and tired. Uh, you may want to check out the lyrics to the breakup song by Francesca Battiselli. And she talks about just, you know, drawing a line in the sand and saying, you know what? I've decided that I'm breaking up with fear. That's it, plain and simple. Fear, you don't own me. You don't have any part of my history anymore. That's it, I'm done with fear. And her recognition and embracing of recognizing that she doesn't have to walk side by side with fear or having fear on her back 24 seven doesn't have to be part of her reality anymore. And so she shed that and let it go. It's a fantastic song. If you're not familiar with it, go on YouTube. I think, uh, in fact, I think in chapter 10 of breaking the habit, no, not breaking the habit, becoming supernatural chapter is either chapter 10 or chapter 11. We talked about that. And we also talked about it in chapter two. So you can see the video, but you can just go to the YouTube channel, the breakup song, Francesca, that it's Sally. And I think you'll enjoy the lyrics. And I think that'll, they'll speak to you. So that's it. Thank you for tuning in, tapping in, turning on to Love and Money Secrets TV. I'm your host, Dame Lillian Walker, and I am just very honored to be able to share this material with you. If you have any questions, comments, and concerns, please make sure we're using this YouTube channel as an online classroom. I read all of the comments. I reply to everybody. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, be sure to, to uh, write whatever comments. If you'd like to see more of or less of something, let me know. I am, I'm open to hearing from you guys. And thank you for those of you who have made some donations. That's been very unexpected. What a pleasant, it's such a wonderful surprise. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much for that. I really appreciate that from the bottom of my heart. And uh, that's it for now. And tomorrow we will be diving into chapter three of breaking the habit of becoming yourself. So thank you for tuning in. Have a wonderful evening and remember to smile.